Slowly, Theoden stretched forth his hand. As his fingers took the hilt, it seemed to the Watchers that firmness and strength returned to his thin arm. Suddenly, he lifted the blade and swung it, shimmering and whistling in the air. Then he gave a great cry. His voice rang clear as he chanted in the tongue of Rohan a call to arms. Arise now, arise, riders of Theoden. Dire deeds awake, dark as it eastward. Let horse be bridled, horn be sounded. For Theolingus. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be continuing our series where we look at the major differences between the Lord of the Rings books and extended edition movies. As I have said in previous videos, the timeline and order of the books and movies in The Two Towers and The Return of the King are different between the two mediums. So we will be following how the movie structures the events, jumping back and forth between Merry Pippin and the Ents, the journey of the Three Hunters through Rohan, and Frodo, Sam, and Gollum as they go towards Mordor. This won't make a huge difference in this episode, but it will in future ones, and I'd just like to mention it to keep us all on the same page. Otherwise, looking at the movies and books would be quite confusing. If you are new to this series, please start it from the beginning. I'll link our first and previous episodes in the description and cards, as well as some related and helpful articles that aided with the creation of today's video. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Let's begin our tale. We will start today by looking at the events of the Entmoot. In the movie, there are quite a few scenes with the hobbits and Treebeard, some talking about the Entwives or Sauron or other things. We also get a scene with a tree that buried Pippin and Merry, leaving Treebeard to come and save them. That is a reference to Tom Bombadil and Old Man Willow from the Fellowship of the Ring book, as such an event did not happen at this point in the Two Towers. Eventually, there was an Entmoot at which the Ents decided the hobbits are in fact hobbits and not orcs, and at the Entmoot, they chose not to go to war. Treebeard began to take the hobbits to the edge of the forest, but Pippin wanted him to go to the south part of the forest, near Isengard. Only then did Treebeard see the true devastation upon his forest, and he decided to go to war. Some Huorns made for Helm's Deep, while many of the Ents made ready to go to Isengard. In the book, the Entmoot took a similarly long time, and the hobbits spent most of their time over those few days with the hasty Ent Regalad, or Quickbeam, who already decided he wanted to go to war. In the book, Treebeard and many other Ents were already enraged enough, so their Entmoot made them agree to go to war. They went off to Isengard, singing of war. That part seems definitely more hasty in the book than in the movie, even though the Entmoot still took a long time, as the Ents and Fangorn himself knew much already of the treason of Isengard whereas in the movie they still needed to find out how treacherous Saruman had been. Now concerning the Three Hunters and the White Rider, and how their scenes are portrayed in the movie. Gandalf returned to the Three at the turn of the tide, and the Three had some dialogue with Gandalf before leaving the Fangorn Forest. Shadowfax appeared for the first time, and with him came Hasufel and Erod. The four companions then made haste towards Adaras. We get a scene with Gandalf reflecting on the heir of Numenor, Aragorn, and how Sauron still has fear and doubt about that heir. In the scene, he speaks also about Rohan and Theoden's mind being enslaved. Gandalf said that Frodo was their hope, and Aragorn told Gandalf that Sam went with Frodo and the Ring. And at this, Gandalf was glad. This scene mostly seems to have inspiration drawn from when Gandalf first reunited with the Three Hunters in the Fangorn in the book. After this scene, they rode on and came to Edoras, where of course Grima and Saruman had taken hold. Gandalf eventually released Theoden from the spell after some conflict, and then by Aragorn's mercy, Grima was spared and let go. Then the people of Rohan held a funeral for Theodred. In the book, Theodred was never brought back from the forts of Isen, rather he was buried where he died. Finally, they took counsel about the coming tide of war, as children came out of the Westfold on horseback, which had been burned by wild men of Dunland. Gandalf told Theoden to strike out, but Theoden decided that his people should rather go to the fastness of Helm's Deep to seek safety. As the town made ready to depart, Gandalf went to look for Eomir, not joining them in the retreat to Helm's Deep. Thus Eowyn and the women and children went with the host of Rohan to Helm's Deep, whereas this was not so in the book. Around this same time, Saruman and Grima discussed the ring that Grima saw on Aragorn's hand, so Sauron knew that Gandalf worked alongside the heir of Isildur. In the book, Aragorn betrothed Arwen many years before, 
giving her the Ring of Bari here at that time, so he bore no such ring during the events of the War of the Ring. Now looking at the book concerning all of this, there are actually quite a few differences. First, Gandalf, who the Three Hunters saw as their captain, led them directly to Edoras from Fangorn, thus fulfilling their obligation to Eomir, and there is much time dedicated to describing the scenery of the land ere they reached Rohan's capital. Stopping outside of the town, the four reflected on the mounds of the dead kings of Rohan and the lore of Rohan, for Aragorn recited the horse and the rider poem, and then they had a discussion with the guards of Rohan outside of the gate. Now what is most fascinating in a Tolkienian sort of way is that generally the Rohirrim most often spoke in their own tongue of Rohirric, but they could also speak the common tongue to outsiders. We don't see many of their words in the book, but we do see some. Rather, Tolkien typically writes that they say a particular thing in their own language. The language, as far as I can tell, is most akin to Old English. Anyway, the guards recognized that Gandalf's horse was one of the Maras. The four eventually entered the town, and it is described in a great fashion as a mighty town of old, with large stairs, streams of water flowing from horsehead fountains, and many townhouses on their way up to the Golden Hall of Meadowseld. They came at last to the Golden Hall of Meadowseld, and the door ward, Hama, came forth and demanded their weapons, for they could not enter with them. While this does happen in the movie, Aragorn actually is far more enraged by this in the book, for he had Anduril with him at this point. He would relent even after they almost came to blows in the town, the hunters and the men of Rohan. Up until this point, Aragorn had been an arbiter when situations looked dire between those who should be friends, but Anduril and its importance made Aragorn more into an aggressor in this particular scenario. Indeed, he would relent, but he would place the sword in its sheath upon the wall himself, saying no man should touch it. Death would come to any who drew the sword of Elendil besides Elendil's heir. Hama was amazed to hear this, and said it would be so. Indeed, it is quite a different moment in the book than it is in the movie. But like in the movie, Gandalf would not be parted from his staff. They went into the Golden Hall, examining the great paved floor, the pillars, and the woven cloths upon the walls, telling stories of Rohan's history. There would not be fighting here as there is in the movie, and it is not, at least in my mind, as clear as to what ailed Theoden in the book as it is in the movie. While I do think it was likely a similar evil or curse of Saruman through Wormtongue upon the king, Theoden suffered from what seems to be dotage, depression, and discourtesy, and such things had been made worse by Grima. Theoden would indeed be discourteous to Gandalf during their dialogue, as would Grima, of course, speaking ills of Lothlorien. Gimli made ready to teach him respect for that comment, but Gandalf rather restrained him and sang of Lorien, and then he discarded his ragged cloak and showed his true white light, even as his powers brought darkness upon the hall. Gandalf thus convinced Theoden to come outside and see his kingdom for what it was, and so his darkness fell from him, and Theoden cast aside his cane, needing it no longer. He said alas for Boromir, and knew that these evil days would be his, for while the young perished, the old lingered. Theoden rallied his people outside of his hall, and saw Eomir freed from his imprisonment, for he was indeed being held, rather than banished as it was in the movie. Eomir offered a sword to his king, and Theoden took it up. Theoden's mind was cleared, and he knew what evils laid upon his land. Now here is a big difference. Theoden decided he would ride to war with his men, and he would plan to go to Isengard, rather than preemptively retreating to Helm's Deep. Of course, in the end, they would all end up at Helm's Deep later, for the armies they sought to destroy were far larger and closer to them than they had thought, but that will be discussed in the next video. Theoden gave Grima a horse, and judged him based on if he would be loyal and ride to war with Theoden, or go to his master Saruman. He chose the latter option, of course. There would be a feast at which we see some Rohiric words being spoken, and Eowyn, who evidently began to have feelings for Aragorn, would be chosen to lead the people of Rohan from Edoras to Dunharrow, in the absence of the king. The king gave gifts to his new friends, and the greatest gift, Shadowfax, was given to Gandalf, his friend of old, who had returned to him in his most dire need. The time soon came when the Rohirrim rode off from Edoras to war, and Gimli rode with Eomir, his then friend, and Legolas, Aragorn, and Gandalf rode close at hand. And so, 
all of them departed at Ras. Now let's turn our attention to the story of Sam, Frodo, and Gollum in the East. In the movie, they came to the Black Gate and saw it closed. Frodo and Sam, even with an army of Easterlings entering the gate, nearly attempted to enter. But Gollum saved them from their foolishness, offering an alternative path. Frodo placed his trust in Gollum once more, even against the will of Sam, and they went south into Ithilien. Frodo and Sam argued about Gollum, for Frodo thought he could be saved and Sam did not. Frodo was also himself visibly struggling with the ring. Sam would cook some coney, of course, getting our famous conversation about taters, and eventually the three would realize that a battle was happening near at hand. Haradrim and their Mumakil were being attacked by rangers of Athelion. These rangers, led by Faramir, captured the two hobbits and took them to Henethanun, even while Gollum escaped their clutches. We see that Faramir loved his brother Boromir, getting a flashback sequence to Boromir reclaiming Osgiliath, and then we saw how Faramir had a vision of his brother's corpse floating by on the river Anduin in an elven boat. Faramir learned of the One Ring, and ultimately decided that the ring would go to Gondor, even though he would change his mind later. They would capture Gollum who was fishing in the Forbidden Pool outside of their ranger outpost, and Faramir and Gollum would have some harsh dialogue. Eventually all went to Osgiliath, which was under attack. Faramir at this point in the movie acted as a sort of antagonist for Frodo and Sam, to the outrage of many book fans and Frodo, Sam, and Gollum going to Osgiliath as prisoners is solely a movie thing, as are the sequences therein concerning that battle. Sam's speech that he would give at Osgiliath would be inspired by a conversation he and Frodo had before Shelob's lair in the Two Towers book. Now let's look at how different the book events are in comparison. Back at the Black Gate, the three came close to it and realized their peril. They could not enter that way. Gollum did not want Frodo to bring the ring right to Sauron, and would rather they went to nice places, or even gave Gollum the ring to keep it safe. Eventually Gollum revealed that there was another way in, and Frodo took counsel, but revealed his power. Even though Sam worried Frodo was kind through blindness, he was not. Frodo said Gollum revealed his desire, that he wanted the ring back in that moment, and that he should never get it back. That the ring would lead him to his doom especially if Frodo put on the ring and commanded it. Sam approved, and Gollum was unnerved, but would eventually speak more of his path. During this time, they hid from the guarded gate on the blasted plain. More fell beasts and Nazgul would fly overhead, and far away in Isengard, at this point in time, Gandalf would be speaking to Saruman after the Battle of Helm's Deep and the destruction of Isengard by the Ents. Again, the timeline gets more confusing in the books than in the movies. The three would talk about the other path into Mordor, and Frodo and Sam seemed much more on the same page about its danger and mistrusting Gollum here than in the movie. It is important to note that, in the book, Gollum did not know why the hobbits wished to go into Mordor, for if he knew that they sought the destruction of his precious, he would not help them. Or at least so thought Sam. As they pondered their options, Gollum spoke about the South and the men of that land, and Sam asked about Oliphants, going through a poem about them that they had in the Shire. Sam's poem broke Frodo from his hesitation, and they decided to go south after all, through the other path into Mordor. Again, in the books, Frodo and Sam don't really argue with each other as they do in the movies, and they are mostly on the same page about everything. As they went into Athelion, their garden of Gondor, they felt once more the change of the season, as spring was coming soon. Athelion in the book is described as lovely and beautiful, having different kinds of trees that weren't native to the Shire. And it, in some ways, does remind me of the Shire, besides the wounds in it from war. It was Athelion that put Sam in a mood for a proper meal. Furthermore, he did not just want the meal, but also he wanted to save his provisions, for they would need them in Mordor, especially if they were wanting to come back after their task was done. In a sense, his coney stew that he had Gollum help him make was a continuation of that theme of hope that they would go there and back again. However, the smoke from the fire that was needed to make the meal drew the rangers of Athelion to them. They explained that they were innocent travelers, and the rangers would not be so hostile to them as they were in the movie. Faramir left some men to watch over the hobbits while they ambushed the men of the south. Sam saw an oliphant indeed, but was dismayed at men killing men. His thoughts about who a dead man was and if he was truly evil at heart was given to Faramir in the movie. 
After the battle, Faramir and his men returned to the hobbits. Frodo and Faramir would have words, guarded though they were, especially from Frodo's side. And Faramir here was somewhat similar to how he was in the movie, being somewhat antagonistic as he did not know if they were foes or not. Sam angrily defended his master Frodo in argument, but Faramir shut him down. But when the host made for Henneth Annoon, and Faramir got the chance to speak to the hobbits more privately, the true, wise Faramir came out. They spoke of Boromir and Lothlorien, as well as Faramir's vision of finding his brother on a boat in the Anduin, and of Boromir's broken horn returning to Gondor. They spoke too of Mithrandir, or Gandalf, and Aragorn. Through Faramir's wisdom and kindness, the ranger was able to glean much about Frodo and his travels with his brother, and he said he would not take a Sealdor's bane, not even if Gondor was in peril and he alone could save it. The men would take the hobbits to their hideout, blindfolded in the final step, for it was secretive, and the hobbits would be treated more as honored guests than as prisoners, at least in my opinion. We read much of the culture of these men in their outpost, as they upheld Gondorian traditions and loved the moon and sun. They would rest and have food, as well as more conversation with Faramir. Faramir would get answers to his prophetic dream that sent Boromir to Rivendell, many months before. The three would get along quite well, even when Sam accidentally revealed that Isildur's bane was the One Ring of Power. Even so, Faramir, of whose wisdom seemed to come from Numenor of old, would not take it, and he showed that his quality was indeed the highest. In some ways, he also reminded Sam of Gandalf, having a kind of wizardly air about him. Again, this is far different than the Faramir we get in the movie, as here is a man whose quality came from his love of Numenor and Gondor. In the books, he seems to have far more of a power concerning fate, destiny, and doom. More of this is also seen when his men spotted Gollum in the Forbidden Pool, like in the movie, and Frodo was allowed to go down to him. Frodo, like in the film, felt bad for deceiving Gollum to come to him to be captured, but he saved the creature's life in the end. Although a part of Frodo would have liked to have Faramir's men kill the creature, so he could have been free of him, but Frodo knew that wasn't right, and it would not have been what Gandalf would have wanted. In the books, Frodo really did not think about saving Gollum as much as he did in the movies, nor did he trust or like Gollum as much. But even so, Faramir's men treated Gollum kinder in the book than in the movie, and Faramir learned of the necessity of Gollum, but laid a doom upon him, saying that if he should betray Frodo, he should find death quickly. Faramir would also lay an oath of protection and freedom on Frodo and Sam and Gondor that would last a year and a day, unless they came to the steward of Gondor before then and they should lead none to Henneth Annoon. And so they would soon be allowed to depart, heading towards Kirith Ungol. In the book, Faramir was far wiser, kinder, and more lordly, especially in this section of the plot, and he discussed much more with the hobbits and Gollum, and learned more than he did in the movie. Frodo recalled, ere he departed, that Elrond said he would meet friends looked for and unlooked for in his journey, and he said that Faramir was certainly his friend unlooked for. We shall talk about the Hobbits departing Henneth Annoon in the next episode of our What's Different series, and we will also talk about the differences of the Battle of Helm's Deep and the destruction of Isengard between the book and the movie. From this part of our What's Different series, we see how friendship and care can do far more than judgment, fear, and deception. We see this in how the Hobbits befriended and rallied the Ents, in how Gandalf rallied Theoden and Rohan, and in how Faramir befriended Frodo and Sam. Thank you all so much for watching, I really appreciate it. If you all enjoyed, please hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about all of this? Please let me know in the comments below. Again, I love both the books and the movies for their own reasons, and for some similar ones, but the book always throws in more depth, culture, and lore, which obviously I'm a huge nerd for. <laughs> However, I do appreciate how the people that worked on the films organized them as I now understand how confusing it is to try to keep with the book's pace but jump back and forth between timelines and plotlines, because one is happening at one point in time and another at another. Please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for Discord server and podcasts. Links are in the description below. I also wanted to give a huge shout out and thanks to our Valor tier patrons over on Patreon. Adrian DeLatour, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Kyle Wetz, Elaine Grimes, Mr. Vat Nadal, Samuel McBee, Jonathan Putnam, Kyrie Kawhi, and Felix Ellen Norton. Thank you guys so much. 
Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a video on Gandalf's fireworks in Middle-earth, since it will soon be the US's Independence Day. Everyone, as always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.